again, and today I wanted to talk about one of those uh, bellwether topics on the left. One of those, one of those key pillars in the world of leftist politics and the Democratic Party and President Obama and even these Occupy Wall Street numbnuts that you see out there every day on TV now. I want to talk about an idea that is absolutely central to them and point out why their interpretation of it is 100% wrong. The idea I want to talk about today is wealth inequity. Now, what do I mean by wealth inequity? Well, think about it. Whenever you hear, especially recently, a liberal open their mouth, whether they're a politician, whether they're a columnist, whether they're Barack Obama his own self, whether they're any of these uh, protesters that are running around the, the cities of America protesting something, uh, whenever you hear any of them talk, there's one sort of argument that you always seem to hear, especially recently. You'll always hear them say some variation on the following. Well, the top 1% control 40% of the wealth in this country. Or the top 10% control 70% of the wealth in this country. And I mean, the numbers change and it depends on what you're looking at and where you got your stats and everything. But the general argument is something like that. Some small group of people control a large amount of the wealth and therefore that is unfair. And the interesting thing they do with that, or the, the overlooked thing that they often do with it, is that they'll say, you know, the top 1% control 40% of the wealth, top 10% control 70% of the wealth, and they'll just leave the numbers right there. They won't follow it up. They'll just give you that number and sort of back off. They don't go so far as to say the top 1% control 40% of the wealth, and it was gained by ill-gotten means because they did X, Y, and Z. Very, very rarely do you hear that happen. Instead, you just hear them say, top 1% controls 40%, and they leave the number there on the assumption that you will then hear that and say, oh gosh, that had to be unfair. There must be something nefarious going on. There must be something underhanded in order to create such wealth inequity. But is that true? Is an inequity in wealth automatically an indicator of something unfair? or automatically an indicator that those who attained the wealth did so by ill-gotten means or underhanded tactics or illegal, illegal ways? Well, I don't think it does, and to me it really doesn't make a lot of sense that anyone would automatically make that assumption the way that the left wants you to. Now, why would I say that? Why, why would I say that it's, it does not make sense to automatically assume something underhanded when you hear of a small group of people controlling a, in theory, disproportionately large amount of the wealth. Why would I say that? Well, in order to answer that question, let's look at, let's look at another type of competition. Let's look at something that really isn't going to offend any of us, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, conservative or liberal. The example I'm going to give you is something nonpartisan in nature, something completely inoffensive that none of you could get upset with, so that we can all have a uh, a set of talking points that we can work from, okay? The example I'm going to give you is one of my passions, college football. I'm a big uh, sports fan, but of all the sports I follow, college football is probably what I'm the most passionate about. Graduate at the University of Missouri, you see here, I have season tickets to the games, go to all the home games, and I could sit there and watch college football all day on a Saturday if I had the chance to do it. Absolutely love the game. So, since that's one of my passions, I decided to use that as a bit of an example here. What I want to give you is just a sampling of a few college football scores that we have seen through the first eight weeks of the season. We're just a little bit more than halfway through the season right now, so we've had a lot of football that's been played around the country. So I want to give you a sampling of just a few college football scores we've seen over that first half of the season. And I'll tell you where I'm going here in just a little bit. Take a listen to some of these scores. South Florida defeated Florida A&M 70-17. Cincinnati defeated Austin P 72-10. Virginia Tech over Appalachian State 66-13. My own alma mater, Missouri, over Western Illinois 69-0. And in one that I take particular delight in, one from last weekend, Texas over the evil and hated University of Kansas 43 to nothing. Okay, now you're probably wondering why I'm giving you some kind of a sports report, why I'm going over a bunch of old college football scores with you. Well, I want you to think about something. You've heard all the scores I just gave you. 72 to 10, 66 to 13, 69 to nothing, 70 to 17. Think about something. 
What do all of those scores have in common? What's the common denominator between all five of the scores that I gave you? Well, in each case, the scores were pretty lopsided. One team in each of those games had a fairly dominant performance over another team. Very lopsided scores, very one-sided scores. You could call each of those scores a blowout, and nobody would argue with you. Now, if you picked up your Sunday morning newspaper the day after any of those games, and you picked up that newspaper, you look in the sports section, you look up the college football results, and you saw any of those scores, you saw Cincinnati over Austin P 72 to 10, or you saw Mizzou over Western Illinois 69 to nothing. If you saw any of those scores on Sunday morning, would you say to me, well, gosh, Cincinnati beat Austin P 72 to 10. Cincinnati must have cheated. No, of course you wouldn't say that. Would you say that Mizzou beat Western Illinois 69 to nothing? Well, Mizzou had to do something underhanded to score that many points. Of course you wouldn't say that. Instead, you'd say that, okay, one team had probably had better athletes, better coaching, better prepared to play, and it showed on the field. In a fair competition, one team was clearly far better than another team. Pretty much everybody would agree with you. That's actually the spirit of competition. That's what competition is about. To go out there under the field and see who the better team is. And by how much that better team is. That's what all competition is about. Yet, when we talk about the competition of life, when we talk about the competition of wealth, and don't get me wrong, company, life is nothing if not a constant competition. We're all competing for wealth and competing for property and competing for food. And that's, that's what human beings do. That's what makes us advance. If it weren't for competition, human beings would still be living in caves and foraging for their food. Now, sometimes I think the OWS crew, the Occupy Wall Street crew, they kind of like that. I'm not sure. At least they wouldn't have any responsibility. But the rest of us kind of like the fact that human beings are advanced. In the competition of life, just like in the competition of football or any other sport, when you see a lopsided score, when you see one person who has seemingly a disproportionate amount of success to the other, just like a football game, it does not make sense to automatically assume that that successful person did something underhanded or illegal or nefarious in order to obtain that success. What, what evidence do you have of that? Why would that be the first thing you would think? You would never think that Cincinnati cheated to beat Austin P 72 to 10. Of course not. So why would you think that the top 10% in this country controlling 70% of the wealth is nefarious? You have nothing off the top of it to indicate that to you. Instead, what you would recognize, or what you should recognize, is just what we recognize in the sport. That human beings, even though we're all created equal in terms of our rights, the thing people don't really talk about is that we are not created equal in terms of our skill, or in terms of our intelligence, or in terms of our drive, or our motivation, or our ability to recognize situations. We're all very unique in that regard, and we're not created equal either. Some people, frankly, have more skill than others in various areas. Maybe it's athletic skill for you, maybe it's intellectual skill for someone else, maybe it's artistic skill for yet another person. But we're not created equally in that respect. And therefore, in the competition of life, just like a competition in sports, you will have situations where those who are more skilled, or work harder, or have more drive, or have some combination of those elements, will likely be more prepared to compete than those they're competing against. And as such, they may win pretty handily. And there's nothing wrong with that. You see, when you're talking about a fair competition, a fair game, in a fair game, those who are the better players, those who are the more skilled, those who do prepare and work harder and have that unique combination of all of those elements, in a fair game, they should have a higher likelihood for success. That's what fairness is all about. We always used to say, may the best man win. We never used to say, may every man win. May the best man win. And if you're not the best man, if you're not the best athlete, if you're not the best competitor in the competition of life, then you should have a lower likelihood of success.
That's only fair. Now, when you take away the natural advantages that certain people have, that those who are better in their given field have over others, or those who are better prepared have over others, when you take away those natural advantages, then you are creating an unfair environment. You might be equalizing the results, you might be giving everybody the same amount of wins and losses, you might be equalizing the score, but is it truly fair? Not in any sense of the word. Absolutely not. I mean, think back to those college football scores I just gave you. In that Missouri-Western Illinois game, 69 to nothing. Let's, let's say, for example, that when Missouri was up 30 to nothing, and then they scored another touchdown, would it have been fair for the referees to say, well, it's not fair that Missouri's scoring so many touchdowns, so we're going to take that touchdown you just scored away from you and give it to Western Illinois. And instead of being up 37 to nothing, you're up 30 to 7 now. Would that be fair at all? Of course not. Because that additional success that Missouri had on that touchdown is partially the result of Western Illinois' failure. So why should Western Illinois benefit from their own failure? Obviously they shouldn't. But yet a lot of leftists, a lot of liberals, and particularly the Occupy Wall Street crowd, are crowing for just that. They want those people who have experienced success, who have been better competitors, who have done well, they want their success taken away from them for no other reason than that other 99% have found themselves less able to compete. Nothing nefarious about, about what the, the top 1% did, just they have it and I don't, and that's unfair. It's not, may the better man win, it's, give me mine. I'm entitled to it because I'm breathing air and taking up space. You know, years ago, Americans used to just ask for an opportunity to play the game. That's all we wanted. Individuals, families, wherever you were, just, just give me a shot to play the game. And let me succeed or fail on my own merits. May the better man win. These kids these days, days, they're not doing that. The Democratic Party is not doing that. Barack freaking Obama, in his own campaign in 2008, said the words, we need to redistribute the wealth in this country. That's the most offensive thing I think I've ever heard a prospective presidential candidate say. Because when you say you want to redistribute the wealth, what you are really saying is that you want to take the achievements away from those who earned them and give them to those who did not. That's what Barack Obama's about. That's what the Occupy Wall Street crew's about. That's what the American left is about in 2011. And at the end of the day, I think a lot of this is a result of having multiple generations of kids who have been raised really without competition. You know, so many kids that you know, they're put in these soccer programs and, and they don't keep score. And they go into school and they're not, they're not taught to compete the way we were, whether it was in sports or whether it was in the classroom. You know, we used to get graded on the curve sometimes, and you, you had to be in the top level to, to get a good grade. Do they even do that anymore? They have all these group projects and self-esteem crap. They don't emphasize accomplishment. They don't emphasize the fact that real self-esteem comes from you having accomplished something, from you having achieved something. No, no, no. Everybody has to achieve now. Everybody has to accomplish now. Everybody has to get a trophy now. Everybody has to have self-esteem now. But what the educational establishment, the American left, overlooked was that when everybody accomplishes, nobody accomplishes. That's not real accomplishment at all. We've forgotten the lessons that our grandparents and our great-grandparents and our previous generations taught us. And the scary thing for our nation, beyond just a Republican versus Democrat debate, I'm talking about the scariest thing for the next 20 or 30 years, is that these kids are going to be growing into adulthood and they are ill-prepared to compete. They are ill-prepared Ill to do what is necessary to achieve success. It should disgust you, absolutely disgust you, any time you hear a liberal or anyone else crow about wealth inequity. Is wealth inequity a sign of an unfair system? Absolutely not. Because in any competition, the better man should have the higher likelihood of winning and should be able to take advantage of his natural talents. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's not the country that these liberals want now. They don't want the America we grew up in. 
They want an America without competition. They want an America without achievement. And sadly, with Barack Obama in the White House, they're well on their way to it. 2012 may be our last chance to stop that horrendous mindset. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.